Three, two, one, begin. Three, two, one. You are all very welcome to the Ancient Order Hibernians Justice Webinar. I'm Danny O'Connell, National President for the Ancient Order Hibernians in America. Uh, leading us today is our Freedom for Ireland Chair, Martin Galvin. Martin, the floor is yours. Danny, thank you. Just a few weeks ago, more than 50 members of the Ancient Order of Hibernians and Ladies Ancient Order of Hibernians conducted a 10-day fact-finding tour of the North, and we met across the North with victim after victim who said that the amnesty proposal of the British government would be a complete whitewash. It would be, well, as one of our panelists said, a kick in the teeth to all of the hundreds of thousands of family members who lost loved ones, particularly those at the hands of British forces or in collusion uh, during the troubles. Last Tuesday in the Queen's speech at the opening of parliament, uh, her son Charles read a speech which said that the British are now going to go through with those very amnesty measures that would be so much of an injustice regarded so strongly by victims across the North. Now, today, we're going to go to some of those victims to describe what this new amnesty proposal would mean to them. We're going to go to a solicitor who will explain in detail what that proposal would mean. And we are going to go to representatives of both nationalist parties in the assembly, the SDLP and Sinn Féin, to talk about the feelings that their parties have. And we're gonna begin because so much attention is focused on the United States Congress. We're gonna begin with Congressman Jamal Bowman. Uh, Congressman Bowman's district includes the Bronx, it includes Woodlawn and very strong Irish American pockets in those areas. And he was one of the 50 co-sponsors who signed uh, House Resolution 888, which brought the language of opposing any British amnesty and oppose any British attempt to, uh, if I get the language exactly right, opposes any attempt by the British government to implement amnesty or statute of limitations laws that would aid or inhibit investigations and prosecutions of crimes committed during the troubles, including Bloody Sunday. Uh, Congressman Bowman, you were one of the 50 members of Congress who signed that measure, uh, or, excuse me, who co-sponsored it. Congress passed it you, without opposition on March 17th. And now you find this week that the British government is going to go ahead with that very measure that you and the other congressmen had opposed so strongly. What's your reaction as a member of Congress? So first of all, good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for having me. So I strongly oppose the British government's attempt to implement amnesty legislation for those who committed crimes during the troubles. The victims, many of whom were killed as a direct result of collusion with an occupying military force and their family members have a right to justice and to hold those who committed the crimes accountable for their actions. In many cases, families are even denied the right to a full, of count, a full accounting of what happened to their loved ones, despite many appeals to the British authorities. I believe that instead of offering amnesty, the British government should instead devote its resources to fully meeting its obligations under the Good Friday Agreement and the Stormont House Agreement to ensure lasting peace and stability in Northern Ireland. As we have seen in, our in other conflicts around the world, 
The only pathway to healing is a full reckoning with the truth in terms of what took place and a bedrock commitment to realizing justice for those who suffered. We've seen it in Rwanda. We've seen it in South Africa. We're pushing for it in Israel, Palestine. We're pushing for it here as well. That's the only pathway to healing is a full accounting of what happened, justice, truth, and reconciliation. And I'm gonna to continue to work with my colleagues in the Friends of Ireland Caucus and with the US Diplomatic Corps to ensure that legacy issues remain at the forefront of US policy related to the UK and the US uh, to live up to his role as a guarantee of the Good Friday Agreement and showing that it remains inviolable in any future political or trade relationship with the United Kingdom. Uh, Congressman, one of the people who it was the subject of a, a report by Relatives for Justice, Mark Thompson is on the panel, is involved with that is someone who lived in the Bronx, would have lived within the area of the borough that you represent. A close friend of mine, Liam Ryan, was very clearly a victim of a collusion murder. And I know you've requested a copy of that report and have agreed to follow that up with the State Department, with Ambassador Cronin, and with our authorities to see that there is justice for his family, as well as all of the families who have never gotten justice, as you've said. So I want to thank you for doing that, your interest in the case for Liam Ryan, and thank you for coming on today. Of course. Thank you so much for having me, and my deepest condolences to the family of Liam Ryan. And while I'm in Congress, we will continue to fight for justice I promise you that. Thank you so much for having me on. Congressman, we are very grateful. I know you had to reschedule a number of things. Dan Moore made me promise to get you off uh, before 10 after, and I'm just about at the edge of that. So thank you for coming on and giving that important word to some of the victims' families who are on today and others who hear it through Relatives for Justice. Thank you so much. Okay. All right, we're next going to go. One of the problems that we had was selecting the victims that we would put on today. There are so many people who wanted to be heard, so many who wanted to meet with us, you know, with the help of Relatives for Justice across the North. But we chose two of them just to give you an example, give an examples of what the fight for justice is all about. And we're going to begin uh, with what somebody who's been fighting for justice for almost 50 years for her father. But Patricia Burns, somebody who called this amnesty bill a kick in the teeth for all the victims. Patricia, could you tell us about what happened to your father and why you feel so strongly about the fight for justice for, for him and for your family? Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, what happened was my father was shot by um, the British Army on the 13th of July, 1972. He was an unarmed civilian leaving a bar at the time. The put out that he was a gunman, told lies to cover it up, and ever from my most of my adult life, we have been fighting for justice. There was never a proper investigation. There was never a police investigation, and the inquest held at the time. There was never any witnesses called, um, and in my eyes, it was a whitewash. The verdict is wrong in fact and law. It was recorded a, a verdict of misadventure. And there was lies told from the soldiers that did give written statements at the time. All right. And your father actually was uh, served with the, the Royal Navy, I believe, for a number of years. He did, Martin. He served for nine years with the Royal Navy and had, well, he came out of um, service whenever he settled down and had a family and just was a normal working man. All right. And just what are some of the things that you've had to go through? to get justice, to clear your father's name and to get the truth about what happened? Martin, it's been a constant uphill struggle. I mean, no one apart from Realities for Justice and our legal team have been there to help us. Any steps we've taken through the courts, the doors have been closed in our faces. We have been trying to get a new inquest for years, which was turned down five years ago. We were told we weren't entitled to one, even though we had new evidence. We're now in the pro process of the Attorney General is considering, reconsidering that decision. So we're hopeful of getting a new inquest. Um, but of all these, of the amnesty consent, that will all be up in the air. So the years that we have fought through the courts, through the system, to try and get justice and truth for my father, I mean, that's all hanging by a thread at the minute. All right. Why does this case mean so much? It's almost 50 years old. Why does it mean so much to you and to all your family members? It's just, it's so, so hard because it was, 
My daddy was killed and no one seen the car. The army came into the north of Ireland. They were able to kill and maim. They were meant to be the peacekeepers, the people protecting us, and they were the ones that were committing these crimes. And my daddy was killed um, for being a nationalist in a nationalist area. Um, his murder was covered up, saying he had a gun. We lived under the shadow of uh, the newspapers reported my daddy was a gunman. You know, my mummy had to get up, go to work. Her life was ruined. Our lives were ruined. Our whole family have suffered with mental health issues, with um, addiction. I mean, my life has been taken over with the fight for justice. And that is the forefront in my mind every morning when I wake up and every waking thought of the day is my fight for justice. All right. Right now you're doing two things. Number one, you have a civil action to oppose or get a declaratory judgment declaring the new British amnesty proposals to be unlawful. Uh, under international yeah. law and under just simple justice and under British law, as well as that you have a civil case, I believe, against the Royal Ulster Constabulary. What are you hoping to do with the case that you have to declare this new British proposal unlawful? I don't want the, the I don't want the bill to come in. I mean, I, I wrote personally to Brandon Lewis, begging with him to not bring it through. Just the last thing we have at the moment is hope. That we will get justice for Madari. He got someone to reply to say that he is willing to look at alternatives and to consult with others. Well, I'm a genuine person involved in this. He didn't want to consult with me. He didn't take my feelings or my opinions into consideration. This law is being brought out for one reason and one reason only, the cover of the war crimes of veterans. In my opinion, that's what it's there for. Okay. All right, thank you, Patricia. We're now going to go, we're going to stay in Belfast um, and go to Christine Duffy. Uh, she's there with her mother, actually, and holding up a picture of her brother, Seamus, Seamus Duffy. Um, thank you, Martin. Sorry, uh, yeah. Uh, could you tell us what happened? You're actually second generation of family members who were trying for justice. Your brother, sorry, your brother was one, and you also have an uncle that your brother was named for. Um, who was, who was, you're still fighting for justice for him. Could you explain what happened first to your brother? My brother was um, at the internment home fire in the New Lodge in 1989 with his wee friend. And on his way home, he was shot dead by a plastic bullet fired out of an RUC Land Rover. He was shot at point blank range um, from the day now he's been killed, my mummy and daddy have been fighting for justice. Um, they've went everywhere to fight for justice for my brother. They tried to blacken my wee brother's name by saying they had a video of him ranting. Um, when they went to court, that was, it wasn't him. We were able to prove by, because he was wearing a Celtic jersey, that's the reason he was picked out to be shot. Um, the person in this, the video they had, had the older jersey on, where Seamus had the brand new one out, out from that day. Seamus was found not guilty at the time of his murder at his inquest. Um, from that, we've been fighting. My mummy and daddy got word that there was new evidence and there'd be a new inquest. That was the years ago we were told we were getting that. And still to this day, they won't hand over the records. And I think it's just a delay process for this legacy coming out to, to try and stop us getting a new inquest. Okay, and one of the things that um, I was struck by, uh, I was present at an incident in 1984 where John Downs was killed, murdered yeah. with plastic bullets by the RUC, shot at point blank range. It was an overall attack by members of the RUC on a crowd. And almost to the day, five years later, same thing happened to your brother. The British said it would never happen again in 1984. And yet five years later, almost the same exact thing happened to your brother, uh, who was then age 15 years of age. Yes, our, our Seamus's wounds, the mark on Sean Down's chest, the round mark, Seamus had the exact same wound on his chest. Okay. And, um, sorry. My understanding is common sense regarding our cases. They're found guilty, uh, they're found innocent at their trials, the inquest. The inquest. 
Well, common sense to me is my child was innocent. So obviously the person that killed my child was guilty. So common sense tells you they should they need to be prosecuted, but they won't be prosecuted because I have no faith whatsoever in the PSNI or the British government, for they have insulted us for hundreds of years. And I don't expect anything from them, only as Patricia said, a kick in the teeth. And you actually, it's almost a second generation fight for an inquest. I the person that your brother was right, Seamus was yeah. named for. Could you tell us yeah. what happened to him? Well, my brother actually was killed two weeks after Patricia. Believe it or believe it not, but we're good friends. We're family friends. My brother had went and paid his respect at Patricia's house. And the night my brother was killed, uh, he had left my Uncle Joe till the boats. That's where he worked. And on the way home, a few of his mates went in to have a pint. Seamus and my cousin Jackie Dockerty, who is still alive, thanks be to God, were sitting in the car. And the next thing Jackie said was my brother slumped over in the car where he had been shot through the head and it came out in his forehead. Well, we are waiting on the case coming forward. Uh, my solicitor, Kevin, or Kevin Winters, had sent me a letter hoping that we will have some sort of an inquiry or something in the new year. But I'm not hopeful. I'm not okay. holding my breath. Now, just about a year ago, we had the Bally Murphy inquest. Uh, Padraig yeah. Murray was one of the solicitors involved with that. And those families, the Catholic priest, the grandmother, the eight others uh, who were shot down at that time, finally got a measure of truth, although the case is now has been with the De director of public prosecutions to see if criminal charges would be filed. But they at least got that measure of truth. You're waiting for inquest for your brother and for your... Yes. Well, both of your brothers, actually, uh, two members of the Duffy family, the two Seamuses. Uh, yeah. What happened? What are you hoping to get through those inquests? And what happens if this new law goes through? Well, what I'm longing for is for justice. But as I said before, I have no faith in the British government. And I don't expect that we could move any further. I would love in my heart, for that's what our fate is for. Our fight is for justice to prove that our people were innocent. They're using live bullets, plastic bullets against unarmed civilians. And that speaks for itself. OK. And why do these cases, particularly your brothers is so old, why do they mean so much to you and your family at this time? The fact of the matter is that they were murdered. Plain and straight, they were murdered. And for by that then, they're... they're the names were blackened. They said, yes, just like Patricia's uh, father, my brother was classed as an IRA gunman, that he had a Thompson submachine gun. Well, my brother had not got a Thompson submachine gun. My brother was a member of the Irish Republican Army, and I'm very proud to say that. And the reason my brother was a member of the Irish Republican Army, he was out defending his own, his own community, people that he had watched being tortured by the, P by the RUC, the British Army, and also the base specials. I think I'm too long in the truth. I remember and know too well what happened to my people, what I witnessed happening to my people. And the, I, I know that the Irish-American people know the truth because your ancestors who went because of the famine probably told tales much like our own, only theirs was worse. We are so lucky that we have the media. Okay. When my brother died, there was no such a thing. But thanks be to God, we can stand on our own two feet and we have to fight and fight. When I go, my Christine and my other children will carry on until there's nothing more we can do. Okay, and of course, your brother was unarmed. Uh, this was summary execution or extrajudicial yeah. killing, mm -hmm. something yeah. for which there was no basis for. You're looking for an inquest just to tell the truth about what, to, to get the truth that's, about what happened. That's all, that's all we want. Five little letters, the truth. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, we're going to go to uh, Solicitor Podrick Murray. We wanted somebody who could explain exactly what this new law would do, why families in, in Belfast and across the North and across Ireland are so angry about the new British proposals. 
uh, Project. First of all, you were involved in the Bally Murphy inquest. And finally, those families got a measure of truth. You've just heard from families, the Duffy family, they have actually two inquests pending, that they're trying to get the truth from that. Uh, what is it that these families, other families, hope to get the truth, get, think can come out of an inquest? And what happens to those inquests, those applications, if this new law goes through? Well, inquests have been shown to be an effective tool for families, and there are many reasons for that. First of all, it's a legal process. Uh, we have family involvement. Uh, we have transparency. It's a very public event. Only a, a quick Google search of, of Bala Murphy inquest, you'll, you'll see how prominently it was featured in the media uh, here in, in Belfast and, and all over the world. Um, very importantly, there's generous disclosure given to families, and that arises from the development of European human rights law and particularly jurisprudence from Europe, which was influenced by cases from Ireland that were taken to Europe uh, a couple of decades ago. Um, but very, very importantly, and I've stressed this in a number of, 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 of talks that have done since the Bala Murphy inquest, the key thing for me is that the evidence, you achieve much better evidence when it's able to be tested in court. So, for example, many of these families would have engaged with uh, organisations such as the HET or the original inquest back in, in the 70s where soldiers were not called to the inquest or the HET didn't properly probe. Uh, those soldiers uh, who were who were involved. Let, in the let me just that's a historical inquiries unit, which was found to be ineffective. That's why it was set aside. That's correct. They, 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 they were tasked to investigate uh, the, uh, the, the actions of the military and other cases as well. And they were, and they were found by academics um, uh, not to have done that um, within the law. So effectively, an inquest is, is very different. Um, lawyers have access to the disclosure, the material, the statements. But crucially, they're able to bring witnesses to the court and they're able to probe the inconsistencies in those versions of events. Um, and that was highly effective in the Balamorphy inquest. And uh, we had numerous examples of soldiers. And also, um, probably one that struck me was it was a witness from the unionist community who was anonymized, but they were, they were called C3. And this witness alleged that Father Mullen, uh, was, uh, who had gone to the assistance of an injured man, had uh, placed a rifle that the injured man had, according to this witness, and place it up his robe. And, and, and that, was, that, was, that was an attempt to besmirch his reputation, but also to uh, justify his shooting by soldiers. If that, if that statement surveyed without uh, any challenge, um, it, it may find its way into an information recovery process and may, may be standing to this day. But differently in an inquest, we were able to bring the witness, we were able to probe the witness, we had access to the autopsy photos. I had seen those photos. And it was very clear that the priest on the day in question wasn't wearing robe. So we were able to undermine the credibility of that witness and prove that they were lying and clear the name of Father Mullen. So I give you that example because it's a perfect example of how information recovery is an imperfect process. And it's deliberately so. And this is the objective and, and focus of these British government proposal. Information depends on the quality of the statement taker and the honesty of the statement maker. OK. And without a legal process to probe those, uh, to find the inconsistencies, if they exist, um, then we, we, we're going to have a difficulty. Families are not going to get truth and justice, and we won't have a process that is fair uh, and, and comes to the proper conclusions at the end of it. So inquest and, and other legal processes, for that reason, um, are very, impo very important. All right, another process that has been used effectively, you've been involved with them and some of the other solicitors, our ombudsman report. Recently, we've had Operation Achille. We've had Operation Greenwich, hoping to get to Operation Ashton, which would involve the case of Liam Ryan and many others in East Tyrone. There are other investigations, ombudsman investigations like those. Why are What would happen to those ombudsman investigations if the British legislation becomes law? Why are those processes, why have they been so effective? Why are they so important to families who have been victims? Well, it appears that the focus is to end those investigations, and there's, there's a good reason for that. The Ombudsman's Office have powers, have legal powers around compelling documents, um, particularly in relation to serving police officers, not, not so much in terms of retired officers. Um, however, those, those powers are very important, and they're independent officers, and they can come to conclusions um, and we've seen it in some of the, the reports. And another one is Operation uh, Ballast, which, uh, which found collusion between Mount Vernon UVF and the PSNI and RUC. And that was one of the first major reports in 2007, and I was involved in that. 
So the Ombudsman has been, again, a bit like Inquest, has been a, a tool for families. Um, and uh, we, we've seen uh, attempts to shut that down. Uh, and it's no accident uh, that that has happened after we've had these constructive and positive reports that families receive. So it's, again, it's another attempt to close down those avenues that are effective and that work and that have, most importantly, have legal powers. Right. And in 2014, the British government and the Irish government agreed with the consent of all parties except for the uh, Ulster Unionist Party on the Stormont House Agreement. That had a historical investigations unit that was viewed as one of the key legacy mechanisms. What, and that proposal, the Stormont House Agreement was in fact reaffirmed in 2020 under the New Decade New Approach deal. British government announced it would legislate it again with a historical investigations unit within 100 days. What happens to the Stormont House Agreement under this proposal and why is a historical investigations unit or its absence viewed as so important for victims? Well, effectively, the 2014 agreement is dead in the water if these proposals of this bill find its way through the Commons and, and the House of Lords. Um, the reason it's important is, I mean, I've, I've referred to the Amazon powers and historical investigations unit as envisaged under Stormont House would have those powers, those effective legal powers that are required. It would also be cross-cutting. One of, one of the sort of um, deficiencies in the Ombudsman's office is they can only look at the misconduct of police officers and can't look at military cases. So a HIU or Historical Investigations Unit would be cross-cutting and could look at those other cases as well. So this, this would be potentially a very, very important and effective tool. Um, and I should say that the DUP actually agreed to storm and house uh, agreement as well, and they've reneged from that since and stepped away from that. But if these proposals go through, effectively Stormont House is dead in the water um, and, and what they seek to replace it with is an information recovery process, which effectively has no, no real powers, won't get to the truth uh, and, and certainly won't be something that families can, can avail of in any constructive way. Right. And what do you think the reaction you deal with the families? What do you think their reaction is going to be if these laws go through? despite the wishes of Patricia and Christine and all of the other people that you represent who've been fighting for justice for so many years? Well, I, I've had a, a busy weekend speaking to families. We had the 50th anniversary of the Kelly's Bar um, yesterday, and it was with those families. It was with the family of Martha Campbell, a 13-year-old shot dead by a British soldier uh, 50 years ago today. I uh, was with that family earlier on, and we were discussing these proposals and, 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 the, and their reaction to it. They're obviously very, very concerned. Uh, about this, which we don't have all the detail of the bill. And I should say that the lack of detail and that ambiguity is, a, is an ally of the Charlatans and the Liars and the British government who will be constructing this bill. Um, uh, but family, families are very annoyed, very concerned. They don't, and you've heard from the Duffy and Burns families have said it already, they don't trust this British government. But they are clear they're still resolute, they're still resilient. They will, they will challenge this, they will fight this through the courts on the streets if they have to. Uh, and they're not going away. They've, they've fought a campaign for, you know, we're coming up to five decades now. And some families, you know, four decades, three decades, they aren't going away. The resilience and that, that irrepressible spirit is still there. And that quiet dignity uh, that they have and that resolve isn't going away. So I've, I have no doubt if these proposals go through that this, these matters uh, will be litigated on and we'll find, our, we'll find our way in the courts hoping to have some kind of judicial uh, declaration on, on the illegality of these proposals. Okay. Uh, we next want to go to some of the political representatives. So we have representatives of both Sinn Féin and the SDLP uh, with us, two of the, the major northern parties, six county parties. But we were sent, actually, I just want to read just briefly, uh, the Irish government actually, because of the publicity about the webinar, sent us a copy of a statement that was issued by the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Simon Coveney, opposing uh, an extract on legacy and saying it is important to give a clear and strong message to victims and families, many of whom I know are worried by the announcement and legacy and that way the Irish government will continue to work to ensure that the legitimate needs of victims and survivors are at the heart of any legacy process. They say that they haven't gotten uh, any kind of detailed proposals from the British. And again, when you see the British are not willing to publish a draft proposal, it's not something that breeds confidence. It breeds a lack of confidence or breeds a, a realization that there must be something that they want to hide. However, Simon Coveney said, there is a broader question of process. As we have consistently said, it's essential 
that both governments and the political parties have real and considered discussion on any way forward on this deeply sensitive issue that still impacts many families deeply in Northern Ireland. Victims and families must crucially be brought into the consideration of any way forward. Unilateral action is not the way forward and will make matters worse, not better. The Irish government sent that to us. They asked it to be included as part of this webinar. We're doing that. We next want to go to uh, representative of Sinn Féin and somebody who is actually a victim, family victim, as well as somebody who is a political representative, John Finucane. Uh, John, uh, what is the reaction of Sinn Féin to the fact that the British, despite the opposition across the North, despite the opposition of all the pol political parties in the North, despite the opposition of the Irish government, despite the opposition of Congress, that they simply issue a, a statement in the Queen's speech that they intend to go ahead uh, because apparently the veterans community in the North want it, and it doesn't matter about the impact in, in, in Ireland. Uh, good afternoon, Martin. And it, it'll come as no surprise that our position is that, as we have always done, we, we stand squarely beside the families. Uh, and, and you've already heard the reaction of, of two families today. They, For me, they really could be any family because anybody that I speak to, um, since the, the first set of proposals were published, Last July, um, people have have been very much against us, and that and and that is our position as well. Um, it's it, it for me, it compounds the hurt, uh, not just the proposals, but the manner in which the British government go about this as well. There was no consultation with the Irish government in advance of the the Queen's speech. There was certainly no consultation um, with ourselves as a party, and. We now have a situation where families are wondering after decades and decades, will they ever have their day in court? Will they ever have the moment where they will have a transparent investigation into what happened to their loved ones? And, and that that simply isn't good enough. And um, it's, it's another example of unilateral action being taken by a British government, which flies in the face of uh, political consensus here, because the proposals, as outlined last year, um, were roundly condemned by all political parties on this island, north and south. They were rejected by families, by, by groups um, who assist families. And th this coming week from Monday, myself and I think the, 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 the entire Sinn Féin MP team will be in London. Um, we will be meeting with MPs, um, both Conservative and Labour, and making sure that the voice of people here is heard. Um, because one thing that I did find last year is that whenever you articulated the opposition to the proposals as they then were, and, and we are a little bit blind at this stage because we're dealing with, with sort of scant detail in the Queen's speech and we're dealing with selective briefings to English newspapers as to what exactly is going to be in this legislation. But I don't think anybody expects it to be on the side of families. It, it's going to be on the side of the perpetrator. It's going to be on the side of the British government. There's a real fear that all investigative procedures, such as the ombudsman, such as civil cases, inquests, that all of those will be shut down in one way or another. And this conditional amnesty that's being proposed again um, will, will not be credible. So I think that once once we are over there and we are articulating that, I, I think that, that that that's important because the opposition to what the British government have been doing and are continuing to do, it, it's important that that's heard. And, you know, fr from our part, we are certainly raising that over in Westminster. We're raising that with the Irish government. We continue to raise that um, with our friends in America as well. And I just want to say that I'm, I'm very grateful for the opening comments from Representative Bowman because it really is so important that that we continue to have that American support. Okay, uh, do you think the Conservative Party has a large majority in Parliament? Is there any effective opposition? Anything? I, it's important, obviously, as you said, to raise these issues. But is there any way that the bill can be stopped? Do you think either in the House of Lords or in, in Westminster? Well, you've pointed out that they have a large majority, and it's a majority, I think, of around 80. So it's not a case of picking off one or two Conservative MPs who, who would maybe have a conscience or a, a sense of what is what is right and, and the importance of the rule of law being upheld, particularly in a post-conflict society like ourselves. I think there were some people who were very uncomfortable and, and would probably have voted against the proposals as they were first announced last week. I think what we need to do is see what's in the detail of this bill. We, we, we need to, and I think 
I, when I say we, I, I don't just uh, mean on behalf of Sinn Féin. I think we all have a responsibility that we dissect that that piece of legislation in its in its draft form once we see it, and that we we outline to those people within the Conservative Party just how damaging this will be, just how much you will be setting back. Um, I, I think. The, the, the side of the peace process that was certainly supposed to deliver for victims uh, hasn't. And I think this, this piece of legislation will, will set it back further. And it just, it, it, it compounds it for me, for families, and it, it, it passes it on from one generation to the next. And, and people shouldn't have to do that. Um, so I think it is important that, that we go to Westminster with that message. Um, and as I say, once we have more detail as to what's in the legislation, then I think that certainly strengthens all of our arguments and the opposition against it. All right. Final question. Um, one of the things that the British use, one of the statistics or points that they're making is to say again, as they said for a long time, that only 10 percent of the killings were done by British forces. That completely ignores any role of collusion, whether it was in your own family, the incident where British agents were directly involved, the killing of William Ryan, where off-duty UDR members were involved. Uh, what happens, do you think that one of the reasons the British are doing this is to hide the fact of their responsibility for so many collusion killings during the Troubles? For me, absolutely. And again, without being crude about it, you know, the, the, the statistics will report that it was loyalists who, who killed my father. But as the world saw when the prime minister apologized to us, um, it was very much because of the involvement of the British state. And that isn't something that just visited our door, it visited so many other families um, right across the island here. And I think when you see the emergence of the reports that you cited when you were uh, discussing it with Paddy uh, from the Ombudsman, when you see um, the fact that the system works in vindicating, whether it's people at Bala Murphy, whether it's people at, at Bloody Sunday, um, I think that there is a fear I would imagine within the heart of the British establishment that what exactly went on here is now starting to be exposed and exposed in a way that is credible and transparent. And once you have the the, revel, the, the revealing of truth, people naturally then want justice to follow. And for me, it's a lot more than squaddies in uniform. It's about those who were in the corridors of power of Whitehall, uh, those who were in the corridors of power of Westminster and Downing Street. And the fact that this was, you know, not so much a um, knee-jerk incident here or there. This was very much a policy that was thought out, that was designed, that was resourced, and that was implemented over decades. And I think that whenever that is exposed, people will naturally want there to be accountability for that. And I think that's why, that's what, for me, uh, and I would imagine it's a view shared by many, that's what lies at the heart of the motivation of this British government to effectively prevent that accountability reaching its own doors. Okay. We're going to turn to the SDLP in one second. I just do want to acknowledge, uh, obviously, the Queen's speech just came down. We only had a limited amount of few days to organize this webinar. We did also reach out to Alliance, and we did hear back from Naomi Long, the leader of Alliance today, and from Sorsha Eastwood, that they both will be interested in coming on. They're interested in this webinar what we're doing. They just couldn't arrange schedules to have somebody on today. Uh, fortunately, however, we were able to get the SDLP uh, represented to come on. And we're going to go to somebody who was an elected representative uh, in Belfast, I think for 31 years altogether, and have been a leader within the uh, SDLP party, Alex Outwood. Alex, what's your reaction to the new British legacy laws or proposals? Well, first of all, Martin, uh, thank you um, for the invitation and uh, thank you for uh, the voices of victims that we've heard today because um, uh, that should be, uh, the voice of victims should be what we listen to first and foremost and first and last. Um, so our, our view is, as with many others, um, are all every, everybody on this call, um, what the British government are determined to do in their proposals from last week, when we see the detail, and what they proposed in the command paper last year, and what they've been trying to do in their subversion of the proposals at Stormont House, is to shut the door on justice, truth, accountability. 
And this is just the, the, the latest version of that intention and that ambition. Um, and from the little that we know, and people know very little, it does appear that the British government are determined to table legislation and move it to second reading uh, before the summer recess. Now, we've heard this before, and that hasn't happened before. And the efforts of everybody to derail that in the past has worked. But it does appear that on this occasion, uh, the British government seemed to have some further determination to see this over the wall between now and the uh, summer in terms of the second reading of any legacy legislation. And, and given the political context and environment in Westminster at the moment and the vulnerabilities and conduct of the Prime Minister in particular, um, that'll get this issue is again going to get caught up in all that uh, the, uh, environment that difficult politics and the effort to save the Prime Minister's bacon. Okay, and what uh, what is your party going to do to try and prevent these laws from coming into effect? So if you go back through all the negotiations uh, since the Good Friday Agreement, and in the Good Friday Agreement, we, we've just argued that uh, uh, any processes to deal with the past have to be uh, uh, victim-centred and more than that we've argued that uh, victims and their advocates should be involved in the design and in the accountability around any legacy proposals and that continues to be our position that uh, truth, justice, accountability for what happened during the days of conflict in, in Ireland and uh, in other places um, that uh, whoever the perpetrators were, whatever the background, whatever the organisation, whether a state or non-state, then victims are entitled to truth, justice and accountability as individual victims wish it to be uh, and their views should be sovereign. So that remains the case. And as some people have said over the last number of days, in the absence of detail, it has to be said this latest proposal, again, seems to be a proposal that's not about victims and survivors, but it is about the interests of perpetrators, uh, because perpetrators of whatever background will have the benefit of this process uh, if, that, if this is what transpires over the next period of time. So we'll try to derail it in Westminster. Um, uh, uh, as uh, John said, um, there is some level of disquiet in some places on the backbenchers in Westminster, um, but it's far from universal. So it's an attempt to, once again, galvanise the opposition within the House of Commons and the House of Lords, galvanise the opposition outside Westminster, galvanise the opposition in, uh, in other places. And thus far, it's been successful in uh, impeding the British government in their ambition to close down avenues to uh, truth, justice and accountability. And I think John is right in this regard, uh, or maybe it was uh, Paddy, but um, uh, uh, the inquests, civil actions, the ombudsman um, and other due process remedies and processes, they're all going to get derailed on the far side of these proposals. So once again, it's trying to create the maximum opposition to once again stop the British government with their ambition. All right. And Colin Eastwood, of course, your party leader is a member of parliament. Does he have any strategy or, or uh, way of going about that, trying to galvanize opposition to uh, these proposals within Westminster? Well, um, our two MPs in Westminster are forever uh, talking to members of the House of Lords and the House of Commons. Uh, to, to say that uh, anything of this would be rightly opposed in Britain, in any part of Britain, um, that there are a multitude of cases in Britain where uh, people, uh, families campaign for justice and truth in relation to uh, past wrongdoing, and yet 
whilst MPs and the members of the House of Lords and the British government support those victims and survivors in their ambitions and their uh, uh, campaigns, they will uh, rip that away from victims and families and survivors here. So um, they constantly talk to people to try to get them to understand that you cannot, uh, families who have suffered so greatly, um, whatever the cause of their loss, um, cannot be treated like this. Um, and they would oppose it, wouldn't they, if it was in their own constituencies, their own towns and villages, their own backyard, um, and in that way. But, but um, you know, the, the politics is so nasty and the... the the conduct of the government is so appalling that it just needs, uh, once again, the maximum effort from all those who truly stand for victims and survivors, whatever their background. All right, we were gonna go to our uh, vice president who was also on the tour, uh, co-leader of the tour that just came back, fact-finding tour, which just came back from the North, Sean Pender. Thank you, Martin, and thanks to, uh, to all. We've had a couple of questions have come in while we're doing this. I'd like to uh, <clears throat> put them to the to panelists, to uh, um, Patty Mur uh, Murray. A um, question came about this legislation that we're talking that was uh, addressed or hinted at in the Queen's speech. Uh, when will we get the chance to see that in its entirety? And is there any surprises that you may expect? Um, and what is the process from the time it is re re um, released and then voted on or any timeline you might think of? Um, well, Alex just alluded to um, how this might go uh, in a speedy passage before the summer, so you might be better to comment on that. I mean, it's the first time I've heard that, and I'm quite interested in that, but not, not entirely surprised. Normal legislation can take quite a bit of time, and there are various readings and various opportunities for, for, for MPs and, and, and the Commons, and also there's an opportunity in the Lords um, to, to chip away at it and effectively uh, make amendments and get those amendments passed. There, there are emergency procedures, uh, speedy procedures, which could allow this to go through fairly quickly, which is obviously something we don't want. Uh, but again, I'll, I'll probably defer to the Alec and maybe he, he, could, he could talk about that. Um, it's really important that uh, families and also their advocates, whether the NGOs and, and, and lawyers and, and civic society, you know, there are other organizations helping families get to look at any draft bill so that they can then lobby their political representatives. They can lobby uh, at the House of Commons they can lobby wherever they need to go, um, government as well, the Irish government. So it's very important we get some time to do that. There is a concern that they'll try and do this quickly, that that process will, will, be, will be handicapped in some way. But it's vaguely important. And as Alex said, we've been successful in the past uh, when we've had time to organise, uh, to lobby, to, to, to engage even the United States, who have been important in the past as well. So in terms of timelines, I mean, I'm, I'm very interested in what Alex said. Um, if, 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 the, if the intentions to do that before the summer, it's, it should be very concerning to all of us. And, and, you know, the quicker we get information on that. In terms of surprises, I, I don't, you know, I mean, we, the, the latest statement from the Queen's speech is, is lacks detail. Um, and, and I think that's, that's very deliberate. Um, but we don't trust the British government. Um, we, the only surprise we... <laughs> The only surprise we won't have is that they will try and skew this in, in, in favour of veterans, in favour of uh, state actors. Um, and, and, and if they can get away with that, they will do that. So it's vaguely important we're very vigilant and that we, we keep in touch with the information there uh, that we engage in the coming weeks. But this, this could happen very, very quickly. There are numbers, I should say, there are a number of legacy inquests listed. Um, Kelly's Bar starts the week after next. I'm also involved in an inquest in September, uh, three uh, RA members killed in Coke. I'm also involved in one in December, another in February. So these inquests and civil actions are, are negotiations are underway in Balamurphy around civil actions as well. There's a lot happening. And my concern is the reaction to that will be to try and close these down because they are moving very, very, very effectively, much more so than in, than in the past. And this will be an attempt to pass this through quickly and slow that process down and stop the Burns and the Duffy families and, and families like that who are, who are at the earlier stages of trying to get new inquests to knock that on, on, on the head very, very quickly. So we should be very vigilant in the coming, the coming weeks. Thank you. Uh, we also learned, I'll leave this out, um, someone in the chat reminded us, Dan, that um, the plastic bullets would some look as a, a sin of the past. And in fact, uh, the British are, um, are still... Be, be, being trained in the use of plastic bullets today. 
Uh, can someone uh, comment on that uh, as well? Sorry, say that again, Cotton. What that was the, your question? That the uh, the police in Britain are still trained in, in the use of plastic uh, plastic bullets, despite of all the uh, tragedies in the past. Is that the yeah. uh, is that correct? Is that question for they're being trained for use in the north of Ireland? I don't know if they would ever use them uh, in England. No, they've never been used in England. Okay. Sean, any other questions? I think that's what we have for uh, for the questions right there. Want to give uh, Mark just a, a minute, just to come, a couple of minutes just to sum up that Mark was so helpful to us in to arranging today's webinar, arranging all the webinars we've done with victims that we've done, and arranging so many of the things we were able to accomplish uh, on the recent fact-finding tour. Um, no, thanks, Martin, and thanks, everyone, at the Freedom for Ireland, the OHL, the OH, and all the contributors, but particularly the Burns and the, the Duffy family. I suppose, in short, just for the broader audience, since the British Army were deployed into the north of Ireland from 68-69 until the 1998 Good Friday Agreement, there was no justice for anyone killed by the British Army or the RUC or through collusion. There was no justice, no investigation. There was nothing, only insult the injury. The 1998 agreement was only achieved by help from the United States, the political weight of the Irish-American diaspora, coming and bringing to bear, to neutralize the influence of the British and independently chair our talks and achieve an agreement. At the heart of that agreement was the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights in the domestic legislation known as the 1998 Human Rights Act. That for the first time gave families like the Cassidy's, the Duffy's, the Burns and many of the families, including, you know, families that John represent and Patty represent as well as lawyers, that give them agency to pursue unhindered through the law, uh, fresh inquests, changes in the law, the, the discovery and disclosure of information and to bring a lens of scrutiny that hitherto had never existed. And since 1998 until the current, as we sit here today, what the UK government has done in the court in Belfast is they've fought families tooth and nail. They've used closed material procedures, secret courts. They've used public interest immunity. They've destroyed evidence. They've destroyed ballistic evidence. They've protected agents and witnesses. And they've prevaricated every step of the way. And when we get to the point where the narrative changes about what they've done, the families and communities, and it comes closer to the truth, there's this reputational damage that they're keen to they, uh, save in terms of themselves, but to continue to promote the two tribes that they were in the middle, nonsense about their involvement in our country, and everything's coming crashing down within the courts. There are 11, over 1,100 civil cases from right across the community about murder, collusion, death, extrajudicial killings, torture, all of it. There are 450 plus cases with the police ombudsman's office in the misfeasance in public office in the involvement in collusion where prima facie evidence exists. There are scores of inquests that people like John and Patty and others are representing on. There's scores more before the Attorney General to reopen. The PS and I themselves are sitting with a caseload of 1,400 cases that they're refusing to move on. And all of this is about cover up. And then when it before it comes crashing down with a weight of justice and truth. What do they do? They legislate for a blanket amnesty and they've dressed up what's in the Queen's speech to give a tick box exercise. So at the beginning of this video, we saw a great entitlement in the, the AOH video saying a voice for Irish Americans. Your voices helped the derail where, where they wanted to push this through last year. We need your voices. We need the Good Friday Agreement protected. We need justice and truth as part of the peace agreement. And Irish America can deliver that. So we need to stand up the British bad faith and stand up them. I want to thank everybody who's been excellent, particularly the families, but you have been excellent in Irish America and stand with us as you have done. Thank you. All right, we're nearing 12 o'clock. It's uh, in New York, uh, five o'clock in Ireland. We just want to give everybody a minute each just to go over. Uh, we're going to go in the same order. Patricia Burns. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for giving me this opportunity to speak. I really, really appreciate it. And I just want to reiterate that at the center of all this are our loved ones, our beautiful family members who were so cruelly took away from us. And we never got the chance to get justice. That's what they're trying to do, stop us from getting justice for them. But these are our loved ones who we love and we miss every day sorely from our lives. Thank you again. 
Okay. And we're going to go to Christine. And first, we're going to ask you to introduce the person who did most of the presentation for the Duffy family, your mother. That's my mommy, Kathleen Duffy. <laughs> we would just like to thank you for being there for us. And we can like to please, please, please to stay with us and fight for justice. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very right. much. God bless. All right. Patty Murray. You're on mute. Thank you for the invite. It's always a pleasure uh, to chat with you and, and to converse with families as well. They're, they're still an inspiration to us. And I think it's, it's very important that we, um, we, we, we stay in touch uh, and that we, over the next weeks and months, it's going to be very important that we're, we're very vigilant, watching for this draft legislation and any lobbying support that we give each other. Um, we, we should do that uh, with some urgency, uh, whether it's to political parties, uh, civic society, helping us as well, represent, represent us from all over the world, particularly the United States, have a key role to play. So um, spread the word, stay in touch and, and get agitated because these proposals uh, are coming at us. Um, they aren't going to be favourable to us. They're going to be skewed uh, on behalf of the state actors and we're going to have to put up another fight, um, whether it's through the courts or on the streets. And we need to be prepared for that. So uh, let's stay in touch. And I hope to speak to you all soon. Okay, John Finucane. Thanks, Martin. I, I, I sense that there will be a degree of repetition in, in the comments here, because for me, I've had personal experience as to how important Irish America can be, um, whether that's through the convening of hearings or direct intervention from various committees, whether that's at congressional or Senate level or indeed at presidential administrations themselves. It's, it's crucially important. And if it was in any doubt, you hear that today from families as to how important this is. So I, I want to thank you for convening this today. I'm, I'm urging everybody that side of the water to continue to stand with us to show that support because it can really make a difference. There's examples where it's done so in the past and I think that to to, to stand with us in opposing this from the British government um, it will be crucially important in the time ahead. Okay, Alex Atwood. So um, I, I agree with all the comments that have been made. Um, my own sense is that the next two, three and four weeks are as critical as any because if the British government goes ahead and tables legislation, and then before the summer has a second reading of that legislation, which is a House of Commons debate, and then it goes off into committee, um, they will have crossed a Rubicon because they will have put it on the record in a draft bill in the House of Commons and started the legislative process. And, and that'll be different from anything we've seen before. And therefore, I think that the next two, three, four, five weeks are critical to maximize the effort to derail that intention. Uh, because once that gets into committee, gets into the processes, however long it takes, whether it takes three months or six months or nine months, nonetheless, they will have pushed on to a place where they haven't been before in terms of legacy legislation. And that would be the one point I'd make. All the, all the friends of true justice and accountability, wherever they are, I have a feeling that the next three, four, five weeks are as vital as any. Thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, Martin's having a little issue with uh, computers right now. So before we send it back to uh, hopefully Martin and to Danny, I just want to thank uh, everyone uh, here. As, as someone who worked with Martin to uh, lead up, head up the uh, recent um, tour, uh, fact-finding tour of Ireland, uh, I think I can tell you you have 51 dedicated disciples who are now coming back and, and telling your story. You know, from our first stop in, in Tyrone to our last stop in Dublin, we made sure that legacy was the number one issue that we brought uh, brought out. Uh, we have found that many times people don't think of legacy in the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, but we want to make sure that it is a major component of, of the uh, the unaddressed. And I think it was uh, very um, important that we started with a congressman, a congressman who's relatively new to the issue. But when we tell them the story, especially as constituents, especially as, a, as an area where a, a former constituent was, was killed, it, it, Congressman Bowman basically said, what they should be doing with their resources is looking into the past and, and addressing it and not trying to cover it up because that's 
basically what they're trying to do. And uh, and for everyone in the call, and Patty, you, you had to see some of the joy in the faces of the people from Valley Murphy when they got some type of justice. But in the last year, with this ombudsman's reports coming out, and just recently, uh, Sean Brown got some type of vindication, and Eamon McInespy, and, and for them to consistently to put more speeches on top of it, saying, oh, well, we're going to still go forward to get the truth. The bottom line, someone else said, is we can't trust the British government. They will manipulate the facts. They are over here now and they're adding people. Very important to add. They're adding more representatives over here to D.C. to make more visits to the office to try to pr present numbers that we know are not fact. John Finucane's father was killed not by loyalist paramilitaries, but by the instruction of the British government. Mm -hmm. So the numbers that they present are, in, are, are, are simply lies. What they're basically trying to do is to protect the past. Both the DUP and British government are trying to continue to promote a false narrative of what happened really in the North, instead of just looking at the truth. And to Christine and your mom and to Patricia, you give us the strength, you and all the people that we met and the emotional stories to not take no for an answer. As what Alex had said, this might be in the next few weeks, we're gonna work hard, but regardless of what they do in parliament, we're not going to take that for an answer unless we get the truth. So we commit to you, both the AOH, LAOH, and inspired Irish Americans who you give us the power. Don't ever quit. Don't ever give up. We're with you every step of the way. Thank you. Uh, I'm back. Uh, uh, sorry, I was out for a minute. See what happens when you have a cheap computer? I have to get a good one, but I am back. I want to thank everybody who's appeared. Um, this is very crucial. British government, if they had a proposal that they thought would get support, that would do justice, that would give the truth, they would have published it already. When they had the New Decade New Deal approach, they attached the proposal on language to the, to the actual agreement. It was there because they knew people would support it. Of course, the union has vetoed it the way they veto so many things in the North of Ireland. They don't want to present this proposal now because I think it's gonna be actually worse than what we're all talking about. It's crucial that Irish America get behind these people who've been fighting for justice. Some of them like Patricia Burns for just under 50 years, it's gonna be 50 years in July, get them, get behind them, make our congressional representatives. We did get a message from Congressman Bowman, how grateful he was to be on, how much he's going to be there. We have to be there for the Duffy family, for the Burns family, for the Finucane family, for hundreds of other families, that's the only way that they're going to get justice. And the AOH and the LAOH are behind you, and we're going to continue to be with you. And I know other Irish American groups are on this e webinar. They'll do the same. Danny. Thank you, Martin. What a great job, as you always do. Uh, I apologize for any technical difficulties. Normally, I'm live from Youngstown State University, but today I'm in uh, Monroeville, Pennsylvania. Yeah with the Pennsylvania State Board. So besides everyone on, we have another 15, 20 people here that came in early to listen into this uh, conference. Uh, I wanna thank Tim Noonan, who's on the screen now. I don't know if he, he knows it, but Tim is our IT, uh, our IT person today, um, doing a great job for us as always. Um, I'm excited to say that um, Thursday I'll be in Dublin. And so, although we thought Sean moved there, he came home, so now I'm allowed to go. And we're only one at a time allowed in the country. But I'll be in uh, Dublin on Thursday, and I've already have a meeting scheduled with Leo, Leo Vradica in regard specifically to discuss this issue. Um, I think it's important to understand, I think what we're seeing is a lot of talk on the protocol, which is something that's happening right now today. Uh, but I could tell you from everyone we've talked to in the U.S. government and in the Irish government, they're 100 percent behind the people on this call and, and all the victims uh, in the north. And so I anticipate them uh, standing strong with us on the amnesty um, over the weekend. I'll have an opportunity to be in Belfast. So if any of our guests are around, I might try and uh, at least say hello um, the work you've been doing. And, and I think the thing that's so important for our people to understand, all our guests on this call today, 50 years, they've been waiting, not just for justice, but in many cases, just a fair hearing. 50 years, I'm almost 50 years old. 
well, I, I might be joking there, but 50 years, I can't fathom it uh, living in the United States and how blessed and how fortunate we are. 25 years on from the Good Friday Agreement. Think about World War II. Think about Germany. Think about Japan. 25 years after World War II. Think of how far they got working with the world. And under the leadership of uh, the British government, the Good Friday Agreement has stalled. And this is one of several issues. We're hoping to keep that pushing. Um, I thank everyone for joining us. I remind everybody in July 13th through 17th, we're gonna be in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania for our AOH and LAOH national conventions. We ask everyone to get online today, register, book your hotel room and come to uh, Pittsburgh where we'll uh, spend some more time on these justice issues. With that, uh, Tim Noonan's gonna close us out with a, um, a brief video, Tim. I need